Hi, this is Bob Harrington from Stanford University here on Medscape Cardiology and the Heart.org. We have a whole series of topics outside of the clinical trials world which continue to be of interest to clinicians, investigators, educators in the cardiovascular space. So I'm really pleased that my really good friend, Mike Gibson, has agreed to be with us today to have this conversation. Mike is a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. He's an interventional cardiologist at the Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston, and he is the newly named president and CEO of the BAME Research Institute. Research Institute. Mike, thanks for joining us here on Medscape Cardiology. Thanks for having me again, Bob. You probably more than most people in cardiology are so plugged into everything that's going on, whether it's in your role as an investigator or your role as someone who created Wikidoc along with having a very strong presence in both social media and in uh, what I'll call more traditional sorts of education. And the list I have for you, Mike, in no particular order are talking about artificial intelligence, machine learning, wearables and cardiovascular disease, social media, the hypertension guidelines. You ready to start walking through some of those? Sure. Let's start with artificial intelligence and machine learning. This is an area where you certainly have been doing an increasing amount of work to try to, for example, understand patterns of patients in clinical trials. So why don't you talk broadly about some of the concepts of why people are excited about the application of AI and machine learning to cardiovascular research and disease, and maybe talk a couple minutes about the kind of things you're doing. We take care of patients. And sadly, clinical trials tell us about populations. And while they are useful in establishing the overall benefit of some strategy or its safety, they don't tell you about that 80-year-old person sitting right in front of you. This is where machine learning comes in. Rather than telling us about the entire population, it allows you to drill down and make predictions about an individual patient. It's a very complicated process. It behaves a little bit like a neuron and you train the system. We've used 25,000 patients with ACS to train an algorithm to decide, is this someone who would be at risk of adverse outcomes? This 80-year-old with this creatinine clearance, with this constellation of drugs and symptoms, etc. And it gives you a point estimate for that one patient. And that's very tantalizing. You can look at their risk of events, their risk of bleeding, and then you can do a little A versus B comparison. You can say, well, if I did this, what would happen? And if I did that, what would happen? So we're developing apps with this as predictive tools. And I think that's the first step. It gives you that point estimate but it doesn't do much in giving you a confidence interval around that point estimate. And that's where the next iteration comes, which is using much more sophisticated Bayesian approaches. There's open source software called STAN, which is a tremendous advance in the world of Bayesian statistics to not only predict what's going to happen to this 80-year-old, but give me a range of possibilities around that point estimate. Really cool stuff. Our group Group has pivoted to really move largely uh, into AI and machine learning. We think that's going to be a big part of the future. I know at your place as well, Bob, you have a lot of people working on this as well, but you're also doing a lot of cool stuff with Google and Apple and probably Amazon. So what's happening in the world of big data in Silicon Valley? Yeah, you've captured a lot of what I think is the excitement in this area for research purposes and then ultimately to clinical care. One of the things that's so clear is that we as human beings, we as clinicians, don't necessarily do a great job with things like prediction. I'm fond of quoting one of our radiology leaders here, Kurt Langholz, who likes to say that AI is not going to replace radiologists, but radiologists with AI are going to replace radiologists without it. And I think you could broaden that statement to a lot of fields, including parts of our own. 
that this is one more set of tools that gives you a potentially pretty sophisticated way of making predictions that then can be fed back to clinicians to allow them to make decisions. And that's exactly some of the projects that we're involved with here. One interesting use of uh, machine learning that I'll talk about quickly when you asked about what's going on here is a project we have underway with Google called the uh, Autoscribe Project. One of our primary care leaders is leading that along with one of our informaticians in collaboration with the folks at Google to try to understand, could you, Mike, put voice recognition devices into a clinic room and then utilizing algorithms that are being developed through machine learning, be able to create your patient note, your patient encounter, and do your documentation for you essentially automatically. You think clinicians would be happy with this, Mike, if that works out? Yeah, my God, I think they would kiss the ground. That is, when I go and see patients, I think the ratio is right. You know, I'm sitting there in the electronic health record for far more time than I am in the patient encounter, and we've got to flip that. Yeah, this would be an exciting step forward and a great example of utilizing the machine to provide a service to clinicians that allows us then to do our jobs better. So more to come on that. Well, Shouldn't the computers be working for us instead of us for the computers? I think we've got to get that straight. <laughs> Wasn't there a movie about that a long time ago with Hal? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> hey, Mike, since we're on the technology field, let's move to the wearables. A lot of excitement right now about whether or not wearables are going to be able to help us with our health management. As you know, we're working on a project with AFib detection, but there's a lot more that we could potentially do at wearables. You want to talk a little bit about this? Believe it or not, I have approached this for maybe 17 years, looking not at wearables, but implantables and devices that monitor if your STs have gone up and do you need to go to the emergency room and alarm you. And boy, we're wrapping up that 17-year journey with some FDA reviews of this kind of monitoring device. I think the key in this whole area, whether it's implantables or wearables, is going to be getting specificity and sensitivity right. At the beginning, we'll probably have technologies that are awful sensitive, and we may be creating a lot of worried well people, and we've got to strike that balance and turn down the sensitivity, ramp up the specificity a little bit to make sure we are increasing the amount of care people are seeking and increasing the throughput through our systems and not causing undue anxiety. So I do think it represents the potential for a significant advance, but I think through AI and machine learning and clinician input, hopefully we'll strike that right balance where we're really delivering value to patients. I'll agree with you and maybe even take it a step further, which is that in the clinical evaluation of these technologies, whether they're implantables or wearables, in addition to what I'll call the technical specifications of specificity, sensitivity, et cetera, we then have to be able to close the loop on action. What's actionable? And how do we test that what we respond to actually makes a difference? And so to me, we're starting the journey on how to utilize these new technologies in clinical care, but we've got to do the requisite studies that demonstrate that not only can we detect stuff, but does it matter when we detect stuff? I'll take that even one step further, having lived through this uh, with an FDA review. Not only is it actual, but if you send someone to the cath lab because you alarmed, there's the potential that you may cause harm. We have to make sure we're not exposing patients needlessly to excess testing and needlessly to potential harm. It's not all good. We've got to make sure we strike that balance. Your remarks might bring out things like PSA testing as a routine yeah. screening function, and certainly the urology community has moved away from that because of exactly some of the issues that you've talked about. Yes, we're detecting something, but that something we're detecting is leading us down a course of action, which for some folks is actually not good. It's detrimental, and we have an obligation as researchers and clinicians to not do that with the new technologies. As enamored as we can get of the technologies, let's be reflective here in terms terms of thinking about how we're actually going to test them. Mike, an area that I know that you're one of the leading users of, proponents of, leaders of, and that's the use of social media and cardiovascular medicine. I follow you and engage in conversations with you about research, about clinical care, news that's going on in our field. You and I have talked about this for several years, but now it seems that there's a real social media presence in our field around the exchange of information and ideas. And certainly if you look at our major meetings, things like the HA, the ACC, TCT, et cetera, 
the use of social media to exchange ideas and information and have conversations during those meetings has just exploded. What's your feeling as someone who's been a pioneer in the field, Ben? It's been great to watch and see. As usual, cardiology, and in particular, interventional cardiology, has led the way. We've done so in clinical trials, but we're doing so in social media. Conversation's good, but let's keep it to the data. Let's keep it objective. We've got to minimize the personal attacks. No one benefits from that. And uh, we've got to minimize the politicizing of events. No one really benefits from that. It's amazing to see the magnitude, but the quality as well as the quantity of the content that's going back and forth. What we really need to do is begin to archive this kind of content in a way that is accessible. And I'm hoping to get some of our fellows together to take, say, the radio first content and take all those great images and videos and begin to put them on Wikidoc, our living textbook, so that we can go back and refer to those images and those tips and text techniques and organize it all. It's a great resource, but it needs a little better search and organization. I'm looking forward to creating a tweet book approach where we take it, memorialize it, and organize it a little better. What doesn't work is the approach that the American Diabetes Association has taken, which is to prohibit taking pictures at conferences. Rather than learning a lesson from the 60 million impressions last year that criticized them, they have now doubled down in their policy this year saying that your badge will be taken away. If you're a press member, you'll be asked to leave the meeting and not return. I think that's horribly backwards, and I'm still trying to understand why they're encouraging that kind of behavior. It's a losing strategy out of the box. It's not where the world is going. And if you watch some of the great discussions that took place uh, around some of the trials coming out of the meetings this fall. It's hard to conclude anything other than this has been a net positive for the community. Yes, we do have to be on guard. There's still a bit of what I'll call uncivil conversation. As you know, because you helped promote it for us, Clyde Yancey and I had a series of discussions a few years ago on civility in professional discourse. We do have to work on that. There are some issues that we, I think as a community, we want to be attentive to. Stick to the data is a good principle, but saying that you're going to ban the use of social media from taking pictures, et cetera, it talks. That's just trying to protect the old world. I think it's trying to protect a failed business model in many ways where people want to monetize the content and don't want free sharing of that content, but the world has passed them by. Information wants to be free, and in general, it is freely accessible. So you're either going to get on board with that or you're going to be left behind. Speaking of information, let's close out our conversation with the recently issued hypertension guidelines. Boy, big changes there, huh? Just reading the the guidelines, I think I became one of the people with hypertension. The prevalence went up from 31.9% to 45.6%. Biggest impact in the young people under 45-year-olds, hypertension would triple in men and double in women. So in the number of people who may require treatment by a pharmacologic approach would go up by about 4.2 million. So a big impact from a public health perspective. I don't know. What do you think, Bob? Are we just creating the worried well, or do we have enough data to know that treating a blood pressure of 131 over 80 is going to improve outcomes? What's your sense? My read of the guidelines, and I was not involved in the construction of the guidelines, nor as a reviewer. So like you, I was a consumer of the information once it came out. But as it came out, I was struck by the fact that it's, you know, in some ways, largely based on the sprint trial results, which is a really important trial, has some fantastic observations about the intensity of blood pressure management, but also has some limitations about how that blood pressure was measured, how feasible it is to get that blood pressure measured that way, et cetera. But I'll tell you, Mike, what I take away from this is that it's probably, on average, better to have a lower blood pressure than a higher blood pressure, that it's probably, on average, better to tolerate some of the side effects of occasional episodes of hypotension than to leave yourself with untreated higher blood pressure. And I think that the guidelines did some good things. They're really telling us that we have to really double down on lifestyle risk factor modification. 
I think they're really telling us we have to be aggressive in our application of medications when we do choose a goal and try to push towards it. And I think, though, that they've left a lot of other questions. One of the questions that interests me most, Mike, is the thing that you and I just talked about, which is the wearables. And what is the blood pressure we really want to think about? Is it your average blood pressure over a day? Is it your average blood pressure over a month? Is it your peaks or your troughs? Is it some calculated summation under the curve of optimal blood pressure? I think the guidelines have opened up a lot of questions of investigation that need to be thought about. Yeah, you're right, Bob. And and, and in parallel to that, the diagnosis of AFib, 30 seconds AFib, 30 minutes AFib, 30 hours AFib, when you start to measure something, you start to understand it, and it does raise more questions than it answers. We are just taking these snapshots of healthcare in the office. That's five minutes out of a year of someone's life. And what the wearables and technology is doing is giving us greater granularity about the magnitude and extent of the problem. But going back to the AI machine learning conversation, maybe a blood pressure of 130 over 80 isn't good for a 35-year-old, but maybe it's just fine for an an 85-year-old. We probably will need also to make much more individualized decisions. That would be a futuristic goal. I think this guideline was obviously fairly monolithic in some of the recommendations, and I hope we can get to a more personalized recommendation in the future. I see this guideline, Mike, exactly that way as a step along the way to more personalized treatment because they do start parsing out the younger versus the older individual. But as you've rightly pointed out, we need to get much more granular in both acquiring the data, analyzing the data, and being able to make recommendations on the basis of that data to try to get a bit more refined for that individual as to what might be optimal for his and him or her. But I will say that, uh, you know, of all the global health problems that we have facing us, hypertension, as you know, remains a huge one. It remains a huge one in the U.S. It remains a huge one outside the U.S. And getting us to focus on lifestyle, risk assessment, and how to better collect and use data in the long run has got to be a good thing for millions and millions of people. I agree. Mike, I want to thank you. As always, it's been fun to do. My guest today has been Mike Gibson, professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, interventional cardiologist, master of the Twittosphere, and the new president and CEO of the BAME Research Institute.